All right, welcome back. Welcome to this series on what's your attachment style and why does it matter? Today we are going to talk about the anxious preoccupied attachment style. And this is really like a very open hearted um, energy, which is on the positive, on the negative, it can be seen as very clingy and needy. So um, let me say, if you uh, identify with, you know, codependency in your background, if you are an empath, mm, yes, um, you need to watch this video. And, and, and I confess, I confess, I am guilty of this. I would say probably my early adult years. Yes, very bad, way bad. <laughs> oh God, way bad. We'll talk about that, all right? But let's get into describing the, the, the facts okay, of the matter, okay? Um, if you have this type of attachment style, your attitude might at times be hesitant, and there's a lack of confidence with that, right? In a runner chaser dynamic, you're basically seen as the chaser. You're doing the chasing, right? Uh, and you have this negative view uh, of yourself, yet a positive view of others, which could really be skewed, right? So where does this come from? A lot of times people with this attachment style, they have a childhood where they were often trying to get attention from their parents who were very inconsistent in their affections. They might have tried to control uh, the interactions with their parents to keep their parents engaged. But oftentimes uh, they had parents who were unpredictable in being responsive, okay? Very irregular attention that they suffered. Maybe, yeah, neglect for their needs, okay? So there is a tendency to see separation as something that is anxiety causing, all right? They associate separation with abandonment, neglect, Perhaps they had, you know, absentee parents or at least one absentee parent, uh, MIA, missing in action, right? Um, or convenience parenting, like, yeah, well, I'll be there for you when it's convenient for me or comfortable for me. But if now it's not a good time, well, go handle yourself, go take care of yourself, raise yourself, sit in front of the TV, whatever, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or it could be like an inconvenience parent, right? Where uh, maybe, may, maybe you were the unplanned pregnancy. Maybe you were the um, the mistake from the the last marriage. Who knows? Okay, where this parent's coming from with their issues, but right, whatever deep woundedness that is, you know, it's definitely caused separation anxiety, even well into adulthood with people who come from this type of childhood, and so. Um, a lot of times, yeah, the parents cause distress. If parents try to come back and make it right or whatever, then that child tends to be very angry over the stress and the disconnect because there's very inconsistent parent-child relations, communication, and that inconsistency causes insecurity and anxiety. It causes a person to grow up craving intimacy, but they lack the confidence to really get it. And so a lot of times these people have a high need for ongoing reassurance. They have to be encouraged because there's nothing built within them in their core during their formative years to encourage them, to have the confidence, to go after, to feel empowered. And as a result, this person can be seen as high maintenance, controlling and erratic. In adulthood, this person can be overly preoccupied with partnering and having fears of rejection and abandonment. And a lot of times they will over-personalize other people's behavior. And any kind of unresolved relationship issues from the past can just kind of spill over and overshadow current relationships to the point where they can be seen as overly emotional, moody, argumentative, having bad boundaries, and people don't really understand, like, where is this coming from? Why are you acting like this? It's because there's so much baggage, so much unresolved baggage from the past that is kind of overlaying what's going on. And then at times when they communicate, so much comes out, so much pain, so much emotion that they might 
over communicate and the communications could become one way where it's like, I need attention or I need to be heard, you know, and right, this is coming from a childhood where you weren't seen, felt, heard. But as much as you try to go after it, you push people away. And so there's a lot of emotional highs and lows with this type of attachment style. Um, and unfortunately, those highs and lows might feed into trauma bonding, you know, with a narc. Because right? if, if you're a chaser in this dynamic, who, who are you chasing? The runner. Oh, we'll get to that in the next two videos. <laughs> but anyway, this person is highly sensitive, okay? And yeah, can be prone to feeling nervous a lot of the time. If they feel threatened by loss, then they're going to probably try to control the situation by clinging on and trying to stop separation, avoid separation. And they can even act out if they feel triggered. Like they could try to make the partner jealous. Like again, rather than have a direct communication approach and say, look, I'm not feeling secure in this relationship and here is why, and this is what I need from you. They could go work in kind of some covert type of underhanded manipulative ways to get the person jealous. Other times it could be way to the other extreme where they're being overly assertive. Like I said, bounce back to another extreme of having difficulties communicating directly where they just shut down. So there might be, this might be stemming from a fear of, of speaking up because they're afraid of creating more emotional distance or rejection or overwhelming other people with this inner turmoil that they have within themselves. That again, you know, to that other person might be, well, this is just here and now. I don't know, understand why you're feeling all of this. But in reality, it's going way back into childhood, triggering unresolved issues of never feeling seen, heard, felt, never having the intimacy they so much crave. And so they can not only communicate a lot at times or very little, you know, but they can also complain if they are communicating a lot. They can It can get into kind of a, a venting, bitching, spewing session because there's so much internal that needs to come out that is unresolved, you know. And that might also be coming from a place of, you know, thinking, well, maybe I didn't say it right. Or maybe if I say it this way, then they'll understand me or they'll see my point of view. And so they keep talking, 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 stating their case. And this is coming from this self-doubt or lack of confidence or self-blame that, well, maybe they just didn't present their point adequately. Um, there's also, uh, it might also come from this thinking that, you know, if he or she would just, right, fill in the blank, then everything would be okay. And this is, again, trying to fix the partner, presuming their own powerlessness, like it's in the partner's hands. Like if only the partner would change for me, then I would be happy. That's putting a lot of power on that other person because they presume their own powerlessness. So there's definitely dependency issues with this person where they're dependent on others for self-worth, validation, acceptance, and a lot of fears of abandonment, like I said before. And this person deep down might feel like they have to settle or uh, get their needs met by others. Again, because they believe other people hold the power or other people possess what they want or need. Deep down, this person desires a relationship they really do but at the same time they fear losing it and that's why they're overly focused on other people out of these fears and desires that are you know kind of conflicting right they're making excuses at times oftentimes for other people's patterns of crossing boundaries especially if they're attached to this person and that's why i'm going to say like if you are coming from a codependent empathic background as am i then you need to be very careful who you emotionally attach to. Because if it's somebody very toxic, they can exploit those boundaries left and right. You'll make excuses, you will empathize with them. And you have to watch also that hyper attuning into their emotions to the point that you're unable to identify and tune into your own emotions, right? By the way, I talk about that in my book, Healing from Narcissistic Abuse. Um, I, those of you who don't know, I wrote that book. It's really good if you, if you, if you struggle with these issues of codependency, if you are an empath and you, you know, I talk about how we have got to unlearn this conditioning from our childhoods to hyper attune to the needs of others 
and attune out our own needs because we've been trained in childhood that other people are more important than us, right? So, you know, there's a struggle for many codependents who have this attachment style uh, to release inauthentic, non-reciprocal relationships. It's not easy because you think, well, maybe I just didn't say it right, or maybe I didn't explain myself enough, or maybe if I try harder, right, you take the blame. Or maybe if they would just this, then we, everything would be perfect, right? We, everything is like diminishing yourself. Um, and it's it's hard to accept that actually, no, like this person's not ready and you got to re release them. But it's a struggle for us to do that because a lot of times when these relationships fail or don't work out, there's a tendency, again, because of the low self-worth and, and, and putting other people at, at higher esteem, uh, we tend to personalize we tend to get emotionally out of balance and we tend to become unreliable when these relationships don't work out. And sometimes this is coming from a place of mixing uh, thoughts and feelings, not being clear right from the logic versus the emotion, trying to separate thing, those two things out and also mixing the past and the present. Because like I said before, a lot of times with this attachment style, you are dealing with something in the present moment, but there's so much overlay from the past, the unresolved traumas, and, and you don't realize how it's overshadowing current relationships and perspectives. There's a, there's a tendency to get stuck in the past. So someone with this attachment style, they tend to think or believe things like, oh, well, he's going to let me down. They always end up leaving me. They always end up letting me down. Or nobody ever loves me. Why am I never good enough? Or looking at that partner and thinking to themselves, I don't deserve you, but I still need you so much. And there's this tendency to want to be intimate with others, but others are not really getting as close as you want or need. So when someone with this attachment style goes through a breakup, they often experience it more painfully than any other attachment style because what happens is that this breakup reopens deep emotional wounds of not feeling lovable, not feeling like they're good enough. And it makes it very difficult to recover from these breakups more so than what other people go through. And so for this reason, you know, if you are codependent or you're an empath, realize that you probably take breakups harder than most people. And part of the reason why is because often those of us who are codependent, we don't have solid supportive relationships to help during those times. And the relationships that we do have that might be solid and stable, well, those people might end up feeling quite drained listening to us spiral out of control with our emotions and our inability to self-soothe, accept the reality of things and move on. And also because of a lack of support from others, in those moments, we tend to place more emphasis on romantic love as the main way of getting love in life. And with the lack of support and resources, and then you add to that the low self-worth, we're more likely to return to exes rather than go it alone. So the advice here with this attachment style is that we've got to realize, especially if you've got this attachment style, you've got to realize, yes, breakups hurt. They hurt everybody, but they shouldn't hurt this much for this long. And when a breakup occurs, we have to try to understand the wounds that are getting reopened and practice more self-care, more self-soothing, more positive self-talk. Remind yourself not to take it personal. Remind yourself that other people have their own unhealed hurts. They have their own inner demons that they're battling. Yeah, it still doesn't make it okay for them to victimize you. It doesn't mean you rush back to them, right? <laughs> But it doesn't mean that you can't do better, right? Try not to personalize it. Try not to take it as a commentary on your value as a person. Instead, work on your self-esteem. Practice 
in your relationships in the future, more selective permeability. That is allowing people to gradually earn their way in. You can't just naively trust people and let them in and be just wide open, right? You have to let people show you that they're safe to trust, that they're safe to let in, that they're gonna protect your heart and not exploit it. I think the more also that we're aware of this attachment style within ourselves, the more we connect to our thoughts and our feelings, uh, the more we acknowledge and honor our own wants and needs, um, we develop more of a sense of self. And then in turn, we end up avoiding getting lost in other people and their selfish agendas, okay? And their one-sided exchanges, right? Uh, that toxicity, that th those type of people that are just reinforcing, deepening the wounds, okay? But for you to come to that place where you're able to do that, that self-awareness, self-healing work, you may have to go through a time of intentional celibacy. You may have to basically face down your little inner demons, your fear of being alone, of not having a supportive partner, right? And that might come from accepting, you know, what you have control over and what you don't, okay? All you have control over is yourself, right? This is relinquishing the desire to try to, um, you know, externalize or manipulate power through others, but work instead with what is within your power. Another thing is that we can develop better communication skills of these feelings, thoughts, needs, wants. Not an easy thing, right? Because I have gone to the extremes that I talked to you about before. I mean, I remember um, writing, like I'm a writer, so I, I would write these long, long, you know, I would just bleh, word vomit, <laughs> everything. And then what happens? The, they're repelled. They say nothing. They ignore you. Um, there's, they don't reciprocate, right? Big surprise. <laughs> I say this now laughing to myself, but back then I was just like, my God, I just spilled my guts and you're going to ignore me now? Yeah, they're going to ignore you. They're going to be repelled, okay? The, the other thing is just, just totally shutting down, okay? Or feeling the utter uselessness of it, um, right? I've gone to both extremes. You may have as well if you have this in your background, um, this type of attachment style. And so we've got to learn to power through the difficult conversations. Again, like knowing... I need to have this talk as uncomfortable as it is for me. I'll, although, you know, I need, I need to lay this boundary down, even though I'm emotionally afraid that as soon as I say, don't cross that line, they're going to totally check out of the building. Yeah, they probably are, but I need to be okay with that because it's not about me winning or getting my way or manipulating or, you know, these people. It's about me respecting myself and standing up for myself. So that's something we've got to practice and also um, practicing receiving and, and letting opportunities come to you rather than chasing them like just drop all that chaser stuff okay like just stop chasing stop chasing the runner let the runner run from his own shadow okay uh, practice instead some emotional consistency and you know consider as well interdependence versus how codependency and counterdependency these dynamics, how they're playing a role in your life and how it needs to be replaced with healthy interdependence and how you might be able to do that by having more of a secure attachment style. All right. Well, the uh, next two videos, we are going to talk about avoidant attachment styles, which would be like the runner in a runner chaser dynamic. Okay. So we're going to talk about people who avoid attachment. And if you want to make sure that you are notified when these videos come out, then make sure you've activated that bell for notification. Until next time, wish you all the best. Be blessed.